imagine a voyage into the complete unknown, a search for land that may not be there. This is the story of the Taino, the first people to cross the Caribbean some 2,000 years ago, to Puerto Rico and Hispaniola, Jamaica and Cuba. They entered into a new world never experienced before. The Taino were river people from the mainland of South America. Forced from their homes by the need for new land, they set out across the Caribbean. But they left more than they realized behind. The food they ate, the forests they hunted in, even the gods they worshipped were gone. As a people, they had to create a whole new way of living. As a culture, a whole new way of thinking in a very different world, far out at sea. Major funding for Spirits of the Jaguar is provided by Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Major corporate support is made possible by Canon, providing the power of imaging to express your visions at home and at work. And by Ford, maker of Ford Expedition, the full-size sport utility that can seat up to nine and can tow up to 8,000 pounds. The new Ford Expedition the only way to get there. This program is also made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you. The Taino people believe their supreme God lived in a world before time. There he labored fashioning the forces of nature. In the roof of his house, the god kept a pot that contained the bones of his dead son. They were no ordinary bones, for they possessed secret powers. Hearing of the bones and their magical properties, a few spirits decided to steal them. But in their greed and haste, the thieves became clumsy. From the broken bowl, the oceans of the world gushed forth, and the bones transformed into the fish that were to feed the Taino, the people of the Caribbean. Set between the continents of North and South America, the Caribbean is seen by many as a tropical paradise. Today, the people of the Caribbean are newcomers. New cultures have been shaped by people lured from Africa, Europe, and America. But there were people here before. They call these islands home for 2,000 years. Hey, 
This is their story, the forgotten story of the Taino and their world of blue water, tropical islands, and the creatures of the Caribbean. The Taino first came to these islands two and a half thousand years ago. Their homeland was across the sea to the south, in the vast forests of South America. Here they had lived as hunters in the rainforest, to them a limitless world which they shared with an abundance of other creatures. The sky was also rich with wondrous life. South America is home to more species of birds than any other continent on the planet. There are more than 50 different kinds of macaws and parrots. There are more than 200 species of hummingbirds. This is a Jacobin. The rainforest is a well-stocked larder for an abundance of life. The ancestors of the Taino lived in these rich forests for some 8,000 years, dining not just on the tastiest birds, but on many kinds of mammals, including monkeys. Along with monkeys, many birds, such as the crested oropendula, provided the ancestors of the Taino with their protein. A relative of the American blackbird, the oropendula is among the largest songbirds in the world. The land the Taino ancestors cleared for farming attracted birds to the trees along its perimeter. Nesting in the tallest trees gave them ideal lookout posts for predators. The open area also made for easy flight paths. In nests 120 feet above the ground, the eggs were inaccessible to the Taino ancestors. They hunted the birds for extra protein. But the birds alone were not enough. The Taino ancestors cleared small patches of the forest to grow their staple crop. They did not plant maize, the staple of the Maya people to the north, but yucca, which was more suited to the humid tropics. A yucca bush can spring to life from a simple twig stuck into sandy, infertile soil.
It produces the heaviest harvest of any crop, tubers full of carbohydrates. But there was one serious problem with this wonderful crop. Yucca is poisonous. Its tubers are also full of deadly cyanide. The ancestral people developed a method of removing the poison. First, the tubers were grated. Then the grated pulp was put into a special vessel. The poisonous juices were squeezed and strained off. Finally, the dried root was pounded into a flour that lasted weeks without mildewing. The forest was a world entire, a place inhabited by beings of great power. The jaguar was the most powerful of all. With seemingly supernatural strength and its ability to hunt in the dark, the jaguar was a fearful beast. Its power was revered. Tales were told that it could become human, and it was claimed as an ancestor. The jaguar was a creature that stalked the spirit world, a visitor that came in dreams and visions. There was, though, one great difference between the human and animal inhabitants of the forest world. Only humans could clear the jungle for planting, and they put the fallen giant trees to practical use. This was how humans could move through the jungle, not by walking, but by sitting in a floating tree. It took many weeks to turn a living tree into a canoe, but without it, they would be restricted to small hunting grounds around their villages. Fire turned the sap to steam, softening the wood and allowing the canoe to be stretched into its final shape. Some canoes were big enough to carry 20 or more people, but most were smaller craft used for fishing. The rivers of South America were as rich as the forest. There were thousands of different kinds of fish, and in large numbers. With so much food available, the human population grew steadily. The Taino's ancestors were precision masters of the bow. They hunted for cichlids, catfish, piranhas.
These hunters were highly skilled and could harvest the rivers and the forest at will. There was nothing to prevent them from colonizing all of the flat tropical jungle. They even dined on iguana. The iguana may look slow, but it has a dramatic way of reacting to danger. Once clear of danger, the iguana surfaces and swims for the shore. It's a strategy that works in most cases, except when the reptile mistakes a floating tangle of trunks and tree branches for the riverbank. This raft of vegetation is on its way downstream. The iguana could swim to safety, but he doesn't seem to know there's a problem. Over the millennia, rafts must have carried away many creatures of the forest. To avoid overhunting, the Taino ancestors always expected their children to move away and start new villages. The penalty for staying home was death. That is why a god kept his son's bones in his roof. The boy had been deliberately killed for returning home. Pushed on to new land, the children of the ancestors were bound to run out of forest eventually. These are the people who spilled out into the sea. Two and a half thousand years ago, their canoes set out into the unknown. Over the next few centuries, they moved up the chain of small volcanic islands that stretches north through the Caribbean settling on mountainous islands like St. Lucia, Martinique, and Dominica. Here, they had to make a new life for themselves. They had entered a world where no people had been before. What they had learned in South America would be of little use here. There were some familiar faces like the iguana. Its ancestors had arrived on rafts of vegetation thousands of years ago. But instead of the vast forests of their homeland, these islands were small and steep. The mountains created rain-bearing clouds from the moist sea air. The New Islanders understood the relationship between the mountains and the sea very well. Their first sacred objects resembled the mountains. The peaks produced rain, giving them the precious fresh water they needed to survive. But these forests were not like those of South America, teeming with creatures. The rivers were not broad, warm fisheries, but fast-flowing mountain streams. The fish in them were too small to be worth catching. These are gobies, descendants of fish that once swam in the sea.
The gobies graze on algae, each defending its patch of boulder by a display of flashy fins and color. These streams provided no food at all for humans, and the forests, too, were unpromising. They were curiously quiet compared to the jungles of South America. While the trees, vines, and plants looked familiar, there were fewer species. The lack of diversity was just as true of the birds. There were still hummingbirds, but not many, and none they knew. The purple-throated carib is unique to these islands. This unusually large hummingbird had evolved in isolation here from ancestors blown in from South America. It does not share the forest with hundreds of other types of hummingbird, on most islands, there are just three species. This is the tiny Antillean hummingbird. Its nest is just one inch across. There's no room for competition here. Each type of hummingbird drinks from different sized flowers and feeds its young on different sized insects. The islands had their own species of parrots. Like hummingbirds, parrots were familiar enough, but what struck the newcomers as strange was that most of these islands supported just one species. What the islands did have in abundance were lizards. Each limb, branch, and twig had a lizard signaling its territorial rights. The islands had few mammals. The sea was too great a barrier for them. These little lizards weren't much of a diet. And without some source of protein, there wasn't much future for the new colonists. With nothing to hunt on land, they would have to turn to the sea. Here there was a large mammal to hunt, the manatee. This slow-moving, defenseless, and placid creature weighs nearly 200 pounds and provided an abundance of meat. The leather and bones were also useful. To kill a manatee and bring it safely back must have been cause for celebration. But the manatee was not a dependable catch. This is a nomadic creature which swims from island to island and disappears into deeper water as it crosses the coral reef. Where an island had a reef, and most did, there was the promise of protein galore. The reef was as rich as the forest was poor. It was just a question of finding a way to harvest it.
The varied fish of the coral reef share two common essentials of life, the need to find food and the need to avoid becoming food. Thus, a secure shelter is indispensable. Many fish, like the angelfish, are territorial and won't share their bolt hole with anyone. Since bows and arrows were no use in 30 feet of water, the Taino discovered a way of using fish psychology to capture them. They exploited the fish's insecurity. The basic tools were simple, a balsa raft and a woven box weighted with large stones. The box didn't even need any bait. Once it was on the reef, all that was required was patience to let the natural course of events take place. The smallest and most vulnerable fish soon assembled around the box. Here was a vacant piece of reef that offered shelter. The box soon filled with small, homeless fish, which in turn attracted larger, more predatory ones. And once they'd gone down the tunnel into the box, they couldn't find their way out. The Taino had found a way of harvesting the riches of the reef. From hunters of the forests, they became hunters of the sea. And there were even greater rewards to be reaped in the open sea. Here there were schools of huge tuna fish. To hunt these large, fast predators, the Taino learned to follow the seabirds. The seabirds were quick to spot the shoals of frightened fish driven to the surface by the rapacious tuna. And in turn, the diving seabirds led the Taino straight to their own prey, the tuna. The Taino were in awe of the seabirds' keen eyesight and their near-magical ability to find fish in the featureless ocean. But the terns also offered more substantial assistance. In the summer months, the Taino paddled out to the small offshore islands to gather the eggs of the seabirds. There were thousands of bridled and sooty terns nesting on these isles, evidence of the wealth of the sea. In the breeding season, food for the Taino was plentiful. But the greatest marine treasure of all lived in the shallow water just off the beaches. 
There, in large meadows of turtle grass, grazed millions of hard-shelled herbivores, the conch, a large sea snail. It laboriously propels itself from one blade of grass to another on its single muscular foot. The snail's only defense is its heavy shell, and inside is three pounds of delicious meat. Collecting conchs could not be easier. The shell was no defense against the Taino, and the conch became the most important part of their diet. Over the centuries of harvesting, huge mounds of shells attest to their changed way of life. The Taino had become true islanders, harvesting the sea. The memory of the forests and rivers of South America was fading. In place of the fearful predators which haunted the imagination of their ancestors, the Taino began to identify with far-seeing seabirds like the pelican, whose ability to range over the vast ocean seemed to them a sign of spiritual power. One memory that did survive was the fear of overburdening the land. Like their jungle forebears, they encourage new generations to move on. More than a thousand years ago, this colonizing movement had advanced to the northern Caribbean islands and settled Puerto Rico. These large northern Caribbean islands were just as mountainous as the smaller ones in the south. And here the rains also gave rise to lush forests on their slopes. But while the small islands were volcanic, islands such as Puerto Rico were made of limestone. Over the millennia, rainwater and streams had dissolved away the stone to produce labyrinthine caves and passages. Here, the Taino believed they had re-entered the womb of the Earth Mother. They began to speak of themselves as having been born from inside the island, as the true people of the Caribbean. With great reverence and trepidation, they came to these places for their most sacred ceremonies. These caves were the place where they had been conceived and to which the dead returned. Their ancestors were in the island itself. Their past was here, no longer in South America. A journey into the place of the ancestors, into the womb of creation, was a journey into the spirit world. This was a task for the shaman and chiefs, men dedicated to dealing with the dangerous powers that control reality. The shaman's assistants had to prepare him for the journey, a journey to discover the remedies to heal a sickness or the offerings needed for the well-being of his people. To return safely, he must take nothing with him. Fasting is followed by vomiting, induced by a carved manatee bone. He then inhaled a hallucinogenic powder.
His consciousness altered, he was now able to see and confront the spirits. The shaman sees the spirit world that lies behind the physical one. That is where the forces of creation and destruction must be held in balance. He has to play a part in that and risk this journey into death to help the Taino hold the balance in the physical world. The earthly messengers of the spirits were bats, and they inhabited these caves in the millions. They awoke at nightfall to fly out for food. They faced their own terrible peril, snakes. These are cave boas, and their part in this cosmic drama is reenacted every evening as they hunt the bats in total darkness. The bats can detect the snakes by echolocation. The snakes have to rely on feeling the heat of the bat's blood as it passes. Both creatures are swift, silent, and invisible to the eye. It may seem like an unequal battle, but the snakes have infinite patience. It is inevitable that a bat will be seized, constricted, and crushed to death. The snakes have delicate jaw bones. Only when the bat is safely dead will they release their grip and swallow it whole. This cave houses hundreds of thousands of bats. Only a few fall victim to the snakes. Most fly out safely to feed on the nectar and fruits of the forest. Occasionally, the Taino too would seek food at night. Many fish moved into shallow water at night to feed. A simple hand net was all that was needed because the sea assisted the fishermen. The net glowed as if it were on fire as it disturbed millions of bioluminescent microbes. Fish revealed themselves in exactly the same way.
a comb jelly caught by mistake. It switches on its own fierce light in alarm. But when it came to fishing, the Taino were no match for the messengers of the dead. The fishing bat has no need for light of any kind. Its echolocation can detect tiny ripples created by a fish just below the surface. It is equipped with feet like grappling hooks, tipped with razor sharp claws. This is a supreme hunter of fish. The Taino saw nature as a balancing act of opposing forces, wet and dry, night and day, life and death. The start of the rainy season was a shift in the balance, and the shaman would return to the cave to consult with the twin spirits of sun and rain. If droplets of condensation formed on the image, then change was on its way. The tears of the rain god would bring fertility and fortune to the Taino world. The coming of the rains brought a chorus of calls to the nighttime forest. The drop in atmospheric pressure and increased humidity had forewarned the millions of tiny cokey frogs. The males call to defend their territories against other males and to attract a female, for the rainy season is the time that the frogs breed. The Taino spirit of fertility took the form of a cokey frog. It's the male that guards the small batch of eggs. He will spend 20 days shielding the eggs as they go through all their stages of development, from egg to tadpole to tiny frog, all inside the miniature transparent orb. With the male on duty, the females are freed from parental care, and each night they climb to the forest canopy to feed. It is only at night, when the air is cooler and more humid, that the delicate, moist-skinned frogs are safe in the treetops. To avoid the laborious climb down, the tiny frogs simply launch themselves out into space.
They slow their descent by spreading their limbs and feet, parachuting to the forest floor 100 feet below. Every night of the wet season, for a few hours before dawn, it rains frogs. The frogs' remarkable descent, their ability to predict the rains and to produce fully formed frogs from eggs, made them highly revered. The Taino earth goddess, who was associated with the rains and fertility, was depicted with the spread legs of a frog. The rainy season was a time of feasting for the Taino. Rains brought new sources of food. The forest floor came alive as land crabs emerged from their burrows. For months they had remained underground. Now they combed the damp forest floor for fallen fruits and became the prey of Taino hunters. Although the crabs are vulnerable above ground, the females, fat and full of eggs, need to reach the shore to breed. Out from the sea came a mysterious gift, the giant leatherback turtle. The females come ashore only to lay their eggs. To the Taino, these huge turtles were a source of great wonder. Where do they come from? What do they do in the months and years between their visits? There were many hundreds of females on the chosen nesting beach, but the Taino harvested wisely. Each female lays around 80 eggs into her three-foot deep nest. The Taino took only some of the eggs, leaving most to ensure future generations of turtles. Once the female has laid all her eggs, she quickly covers them, removing any sign of the nest. By spreading the sand and any scent it contains, the female may confuse potential nest robbers. Then, less than an hour after coming ashore, the 150-pound turtle moves laboriously back into her own world. The ocean sustained the Taino, yet in this most fruitful season, it was also from the ocean that came the greatest force of destruction. Huracan is a Taino word. It is the spirit of mayhem. Warm, moist air rises in the Atlantic, swirling into ever more violent spirals. The storm clouds suck up more water as they cross the ocean, building into the hurricane. As the storm approaches the Caribbean islands, seabirds are forced inshore by the increasing winds. 
At the eye of the hurricane, the winds can exceed 200 miles per hour. The passing of a hurricane left a trail of destruction and a bewildered and frightened people. To try to keep some sense of order in their universe and to balance the opposing supernatural forces of creation and destruction, the Taino held ceremonial dances called Ariitos. The Taino were a sophisticated and spiritual people who strove to live in harmony with their surroundings. They had little need to fight over land or food. There were many islands and the sea was full of riches. They called on their gods to hold the world in balance. But 500 years ago, a new force came from the east one that the Taino had no way of controlling. Their world was to change forever. No amount of dancing would bring back order. Columbus was in search of the gold and riches of the Orient. In October 1492, at the end of the hurricane season, the time of chaos, the Taino welcomed Columbus and his men. The Spaniards tortured and killed in their desperation to gain gold. Savage cruelty, slavery and disease wiped out the Taino. The forces of destruction were rampant. Many gave up the struggle to live. There had been more than a million Taino. Within 50 years, they had almost disappeared. Driven onwards by the lust for gold, some Spaniards sailed west to Mexico and encountered the empire of the Aztecs. Join us tomorrow night for the story of the Aztecs and their world of deserts and lakes in the next episode of Spirits of the Jaguar. To find out more about nature, visit us on the PBS homepage at the address on your screen. Major funding for Spirits of the Jaguar is provided by Park Foundation, dedicated to education and quality television. Major corporate support is made possible by Canon, providing the power of imaging to express your visions at home and at work. And by Ford, maker of the 1997 Taurus, the sedan that's giving America more of what it wants in an automobile. Room, power, and performance. Ford Taurus. This program is also made possible by annual financial support from viewers like you.
Spirits of the Jaguars available on home video cassette for $19.95 per episode or $69.95 for the four part set plus shipping. To order, call 1 800 336 1917 or write to the address on your screen. Please specify episode title. This is PBS.